When you're assaulting your entire system with bad food, you're in a state of chronic inflammation. And we can measure that. And we know what it leads to. It leads to diabetes, it leads to obesity, it leads to high blood pressure, it leads to cancers, it leads to heart disease. It leads to far greater susceptibility to infectious diseases. Hi, it's James here from Food Matters, and today I am incredibly excited to have a special guest for you. His name is John Robbins, and he is a person that has had a deep and lasting influence on the health and well-being of my family. Back in 2005, when my father was very unwell, uh, on six different medications, bedridden for a number of years, told by the medical profession that he, he would not recover and that he would have to simply juggle his, his medication, his cocktail of medications, to, to keep his symptoms at bay. I read a book by a gentleman called John Robbins, who's my guest today, and it's called Diet for a New America. And I'd read it a few years before my father's sort of declining health, and I shared it with him and my mother, and my mother read it and was reading it to my father at night, these stories. And it was just such a transformative book because of the way that it bridged the head and the heart. I think it spoke to the relationships that human have, humans have with animals in a special way, and it also spoke to the relationship, how that relationship's changed uh, with the advent of factory farming and commercial agriculture. So today, uh, John and I are going to be talking about a number of things relating to how to eat to save your life. I think this is the core premise of John's work. <clears throat> Another one of his books that's been very impactful for me is uh, Healthy at 100, uh, about how to, what the longest live people on planet Earth eat and how they sort of live and behave their lifestyle choices. So we'll probably speak and touch on a few of those points today. And a special project, John, we've been uh, working on a film secretly together, haven't we? How are you? Yes, we sure have. Mm. And, and I've loved it's, working uh, with you, James, and your, and your whole team. Mm -hmm. It's been a special project. We have, this is our fifth documentary film, and it is exclusively uh, on John's uh, personal story. And it's a three-part docuseries, and it's going to be launching uh, soon. So uh, make sure you uh, stay tuned on our emailing list or on our social media for when we announce its release. Uh, but it's been an enormous pleasure to dive deeper with you uh, on your story, John. And, and I think we'll bypass your personal story today because uh, let's wait for people to watch the film. That's the, that's the, that's the real story. But it is a, an amazing and incredible story and how it ends, I just think, is, is unbelievable. But let's, let's, let's stay focused today, John, because I'm sure that people want to hear from you about how to eat to save their life. And, and maybe we could start off here. I think over the last 15 or 20 years, nutritional science and research has shown us that diet and lifestyle related illness is contributing to many of the chronic degenerative illnesses we're seeing in the West today. What are the main types of diseases that are implicated in relation to diet and lifestyle uh, causative factors? Well, almost all of them actually, uh, one way or the other, um, heart disease, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, which is the most prevalent type, um, dementia, all forms of dementia, Alzheimer's disease, uh, hypertension, can many forms of cancer, um, obesity. All of these types of, of problems are largely preventable and in many cases reversible with lifestyle choices that are basically common sense and an, edu an edu educated form of common sense so that you, you, you can trust your intuition to guide you when you have the accurate information. But we have normalized a way of eating in the Western world, in the industrialized world today, that is really bad. I mean, it's toxic. It, it, it may be the worst diet in the history of the world, other than where people literally starve because they didn't have enough food which was always the problem in the past, but it's not the problem today. Today, the problem is we have too much of the wrong kinds of food and bad foods and food-like substances as Michael Pollan called them. And we are, we're eating ultra-processed foods. In the United States, two-thirds of the calories consumed by the, by the, by the population are, come from ultra-processed foods. And these are foods that have been stripped of all their nutrients. And then they have additives uh, added to them that are, are bad also. So you end up with people, we have this ridiculously skyrocketing rates of obesity and heart disease and diabetes and cancer and, 
And, and you know, also, by the way, the, these diseases make people more susceptible to bad outcomes if they get COVID-19. Because mm. and we have very clear evidence of that, that if you're hypertensive, if you have high blood pressure, if you have an underlying cardiac, um, cardiometabolic disease, if you have, um, uh, if you're overweight or obese, you're going to fare worse. You, your, your likelihood of becoming, of needing to be hospitalized is greater. And your likelihood of dying is, is much greater from COVID-19 if you get it. Um, that's not to say that having a perfect lifestyle is going to, keep you from ever getting sick, but it will dramatically, dr dramatically reduce your odds of getting sick and it will greatly enhance the quality of your life. You'll be more vital. You'll be, you'll be more vibrant. You'll feel better. You'll have more energy. You'll, you'll have less disease. You'll live longer and there'll be healthier years. Mm, beautiful. I, I think what's interesting, you talk about, John, how a chronic underlying condition can be a precursor to experiencing a, a, a worse outcome with a COVID uh, related um, uh, in, infection. We've known also uh, in another perspective that obesity has been, um, I remember this research, I think it was at about 2008 or nine or 10, obesity was the leading uh, precursor to, to death because of how it related to other chronic degenerative diseases. So being obese meant that you had increased cancer risk, heart disease risk, etc. So it seems that what you're saying is that this two thirds of the diet, which is highly processed in, in the US, is contributing to obesity, it's contributing to immune system depletion, which is then opening you up to this cascade of other issues. Is that right? It's very true. And partly that's because these, these hyper processed foods are hyper palatable. They're, they're, there's a lot of salt, sugar and fat and chemicals added to them and flavorings added to them to uh, really shock us with, with, with pleasure. With, we get dopamine rushes. We, I mean, these foods are designed to be addictive um, and they literally are that. Um, the, the industry uh, employ scientists that they call, this is their term, this is the industry uh, term, they call them craveability experts. And their job obviously is to in increase the craveability of the food products that these, these companies market. I don't find a lot of distinction between the, the concept of craveability and addiction. They are wanting you to not be satisfied with just eating however much you might would be good for you. They want you to want eat more and more because that's how they make their money. And while m making these foods hyper palatable, they've also d uh, stripped them of their nu nutritive value. So there's another reason we overeat. And that is that we're underfed, no matter how fat we are, no matter how many calories we're eating, because we're not getting the nutrients that our cells need, that our organs need, that our body needs to function optimally. And your body knows that. And so it says it, uh, it, its way of getting these nutrients is through food. So it says go eat more food because we're not, we don't have the nutrients we need yet. Unfortunately, the foods that most of us are eating don't supply those nu nutrients in the levels that we need them. They've been, they've been stripped of that by the processed food industry. And the, and the result is uh, people overeating foods that make them fat, that make them unhealthy, that clog up their arteries, that make them susceptible to more susceptible to cancer, that that impair their cognitive capacities so that they have cognitive impairments, they have memory problems, they don't think clearly, they're not emotionally resilient, they're stressed, they're metabolically stressed, they're nutritionally stressed on top of time stress and all the other stresses that we all know we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And the result of that isn't pretty. It, it's it's the level of health that we have now, and it's it's not a very good one. Despite spending more money on what we call healthcare than ever before, it's really money spent on disease management, and it's not preventing disease. It's not building health. It's just using drugs to to control some of the symptoms that are bothering people a lot. Um, but it doesn't get at the root cause of the disease. It doesn't heal anything. Uh, the medications just enable us to function, uh, even though we're getting sicker and sicker. And I'm not against Western medicine by any means. It has a place. It has a role. But it's kind of failed when it comes to nutrition. The, the average MD in four years of medical school in the United States, it's only a few hours of coursework in nutrition. And most of that is actually wrong because 
the, the materials that are used, the curriculum materials are supplied to the medical schools by the meat, dairy, and egg industries, by the sugar association, by processed food companies who have a stake in people eating what's been normalized that they eat. And so most physicians mm -hmm. today know next to nothing about how yeah. to really use food. And I think that, 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 that a physician who doesn't know how to use food to, to uh, build health, it's like a fireman that doesn't know about water, but that's what we have. Yeah. Wow. I mean, there's a lot of things to unpack <clears throat> there, John. I think one of them is this, this concept that we're overfed, but we're undernourished. We have more caloric input than ever before, but these calories have less nutrition than ever before for, for many reasons, because of the food processing, but also because of the, the agricultural practices that, that, that we, we, we use in, 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 in the domesticated uh, uh, West, should I say. I, I want to just touch on one, one thing here, and I, I, may, we'll, I would love to speak about industrialized meat and, and agricultural practices a little bit further on in the conversation. But one of the things I wanted to speak about now is that <clears throat> we have a history of being wrong as humans, a very recent history. I mean, doctors used to promote smoking for low-weight babies. Uh, we used to think it was safe to put mercury amalgam, uh, mercury in, in our mouths. Uh, we used to think asbestos was okay. And <clears throat> we, we used to think that glyphosate uh, was okay, but now, now it's come out as a, a possible carcinogen, uh, finally. Uh, so, so, John, what else are we going to be wrong about? What is going to be in the next five or ten years? What are going to be the big things that are going to come out in the wash in terms of processed food, potentially, that are going to be a big, big, big mistakes that we made? T talk to me about what you think are the biggest, biggest concerns you have. Well, I, I, I touched on it briefly already, which is that we're, we're going to realize to our, our, dis, our chagrin that we've been training physicians wrong. We, we've been training them well in terms of diagnosing disease and prescribing drugs and, and offering surgeries and other procedures and, 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 and operations. But in terms of actually preventing disease and in terms of actually building health in the first place, um, our physicians aren't trained to do that. We go to them assuming they have been, expecting that surely they, they have learned how to do it. They're experts in the human body, after all. They have it in many years of education, highly sophisticated education. But that education has failed them and is failing us because they haven't learned and therefore cannot communicate and, then, and don't even know how to live themselves. The kinds of lifestyles that, that, that we know scientifically from an overwhelmingly compelling and convincing and coherent body of research dramatically reduce the incidence of all these lifestyle diseases, these chronic diseases that afflict us today and give us a lot more joy, a lot more capacity to, to love the people we love with our whole hearts, you know, to give from a cup that's full rather than a cup that's half full or empty. Um, we, we are more creative people and we're more brilliant people and we're more, more wise people than we know because we've been living burdened by unhealthy lifestyles and by unhealthy food. And our physicians have not been there to, to tell us that. Now, there are some exceptions to that. There are some very wonderful physicians doing great work and researchers doing great work. But as a whole, as a rule, um, medical school today it ha is failing all of us. And we want to change that. And I think it will change in the, in the coming years. It has to because the costs, the economic costs of trying to care for all these sick people are bankrupting us. And if we actually were living healthier lives and healthier lifestyles and eating healthier food, those costs wouldn't be necessary. We would, we would have money to spend on other things that would develop, create a, a healthier communities and healthier environments. Um, and we'd have a more beautiful world and we'd feel better in it and we'd like each other mm. more. I think there's a lot to be said for all of those things. For sure. Um, educating uh, a, a, such an entrenched system is going to pose challenges, I'm sure, but I'm, I'm glad you suggested that as a, uh, as a solution because, and I agree, there's many great physicians, doctors out there. We interview many of them. You in, interview many of them for the Food Revolution Summit as well. And <clears throat> they're championing this message of, of let food be thy medicine. 
Uh, however, it's a small minority uh, compared to most of the physicians or MDs that, that people would have access to. Let's talk about a little bit, you know, the World Health Organization has acknowledged that, that processed meats uh, contribute to cancer in humans, in particular colon cancer. Uh, so this is quite, quite interesting to have such a, such a government body like this uh, or an international body like this produce a, a warning. People are, I think, are a little bit perplexed when it comes to people look at a, a slice of bread and they think it's, it's all the same. But you could have a, a slice of bread that's made with semi-dwarf, modern, industrialized wheat that's been sprayed with glyphosate as a desiccant to be dried before it's harvested. It's not soaked, it's not fermented, and it's made at a factory. Or you could have like an emma, rye, elkhorn, ancient wheat, sprouted, fermented, leavened, etc., and then, then made. And they're, they're, they look the same, essentially, but they're two vastly different products. This is true across the whole of the, the, the sort of range of foods that we see in a supermarket, but it's especially true um, for animal products as well. People think, well, meat's safe, it's healthy, but really the way that we're producing meat at the moment in the modern world is, is anything far from, from healthy and, and in fact probably leading to this, this World Health Organization uh, warning. What are some of the biggest dangers you see with foods that people think are just safe, they're okay, you know, oh, a little bit of meat, it's okay, but it's really not anymore. This is what you've been sort of, cr you know, screaming out very clearly in your book since, since, since the, the, the 80s, and it's, it's big news. Well, the meats and the dairy products and the eggs, the animal products that, that most of us are eating today are f produced by an industrial process. Um, they're sometimes called factory farms, that involves concentrating uh, animals in indoors in high, what are called stocking densities, which is basically cramming a lot of animals into a space. And um, it's very cruel to these creatures. They have muscles, they're meant to move, but they're confined often in cages so small, they can't, if they're a bird, lift a wing, if they're a pig, they can't take a single step or even stand up properly. The, the cages are so small, if there's a veal calf, it can't take a, a single step in its entire life. Um, the level of, 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 um, of restriction of movement is so, so extreme because the industry has found that if the animal can't move, it can't burn up calories moving, and therefore all of the calories that it eats goes into producing body weight and profit is per pound that they sell. So to them, it makes business sense, but to the animal, it's torture. And mm -hmm. we're talking about... Um, a level of cruelty that you don't have to be a vegetarian, you don't have to be a vegan, certainly. You don't have to be an animal rights activist. You don't have to be a particularly empathic human being, actually, to, to, to be appalled by it if you see it. If you see it. Hmm. If the veil is somehow lifted and you get to see it. But the industry knows that. And so, and because of that, wants very, very um, diligently to make sure you don't see it. So they provide all kinds of alternative images that are that are fict fiction uh, you know they they tell you oh we treat our animals just like members of our own family well god help your family if that's true because the, these animals are are it's not just that they're killed i mean historically all animals if you're going to eat meat you're going to that's going to involve the killing of an animal but i'm talking about how they live um mm. and there's a vast difference between a wild animal who lives its life in, on, on the terms that it's evolved to live and uses its muscles to move as they were intended to, to be used for um, and eats uh, food that grows naturally in the, in the wild compared to an animal that's housed in a, ca in a factory farm and fed uh, a, a a diet that is deliberately designed to fatten it up as fast as possible with a minimal, minimal amount of cost to the, to the, to the uh, industry. Um, the enormous difference. We, we can um, study the difference. We can see different levels of fats, different types of fats in the two animals. We can see different levels, level, levels of protein and different um, um, arrangements of amino acids in the two different types of animals. Mm -hmm. We can see a lot of things. We, we, what we don't have a way of measuring as, as easily, I don't know how to put it in a test tube, I don't know how to, to analyze it quite, is the impact of the suffering that the animal endures 
I mean, there's misery on our in our menus. There, there's there's misery on our plates, and I don't know how to exactly assess that. Although I do know this: when an animal lives in pain and anger and fear and stress, it produces hormones that accompany and are associated with those states. And when it's about to be killed, and it, it knows when its life is at stake, it, it, it can smell and hear what's happening in a slaughterhouse. These are animals that have evolved over long periods of time to know when their lives are at stake and to run or, or, or fight for their lives if, if necessary. Um, but they can't run because they're restrained and they can't fight because they're restrained. So those stress hormones, the adrenaline, the epinephrine and, and um, various other forms, the cortisol, the, the forms of stress hormones that build up in their bodies under these conditions and, and in the slaughterhouse itself, they're not combusted. They're not burnt up as they would be if the animal ran or fought for its life. Mm -hmm. They remain in the tissue that we call meat. Mm -hmm. That's what we eat is their, their tissues, which then are suffused with the hormones of their of their fear and the hormones of their stress. And how can that be good for us? How can we, that help us? I mean, if 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 you resonate to the prayer, uh, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me, a very simple, basic, deep aspiration in the human heart. How can it help us to to eat the products, eat animals who've been subject to that type of abuse? and torture. Mm. It can't. And I think that we, we have evidence of the increasing rates of heart disease when people eat more meat. We have increasing rates of diabetes, increasing rates of obesity. The more meat people eat, the more cancers they have. The data is overwhelming. Mm. So we need to eat less meat and we need to eat better meat. If we're going to eat any meat at all, we need it to come from not from these factory farms, not from industrial meat production systems. Um, but from grass-fed, organic, free-range, pasture-raised pasture animals. And um, there are many reasons for that. But we also need to eat much less. Michael Pollan, the very, very famous food author, uh, famously, pithily, gave us seven words of advice. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Now, yeah. that's really good advice. And of course, by eat food, he means eat mm -hmm. real food, not junk food, not yeah. um, processed food. Uh, not too much. Don't overeat anything. Don't And don't eat the foods that make you want more and more and more and more. The potato mm -hmm. chips and the cookies and the donuts and these things that, that hijack your taste buds and make you think you want more and create distance between you and your body and your actual needs and your biological wisdom. Um, and mostly plants. And some people, that's mostly plants. They're flexitarians. Some people, that's all plants or only plants, mm -hmm. and they're vegan. However you do it, however far you go in that direction, you're, you're contributing to a healthier world. You're making yourself healthier. Um, you're reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, and you're helping preserve biodiversity, um, and you're contributing to less cruelty to animals. I think... There's a lot to be said for moving strongly in that direction. Mm. It's it's really a, a win-a-thon. It's something I would call a win-a-thon. It creates a win at every level. It's a win yeah. for the animals. It's a win for the planet. It's a win for your health, and it's a win for communities and sustainability. So, and, and you know who it isn't uh, a win for? And this is why we're having trouble. Um, it's not a win for the industries that profit from mm. factory farming, from highly processed foods. They don't want this information out there. They don't want people to know this. They don't want people to put it into practice and they will pay for studies. They, they Their wallets are really big. These industries are very, very well endowed and they use those funds to control what we know and think, or at least they attempt to do that. And they've been certainly successful to a, to a large extent. And that, that works like, you know, so I remember the tobacco industry did the same thing when, as it was becoming more and more apparent that smoking kills. Um, they knew they couldn't argue with the science. So they just tried to create the, the feeling that there was controversy, uh, that yeah. there was doubt. Uh, there really wasn't any doubt, but they wanted to create the, the illusion that there was because then people would fall backwards into their habits and, and smoke, which is addictive mm. and is deadly. Mm. 
And so is the standard American, the standard Western diet today, addictive and deadly. Um, and so, and so too, the, the industries today are merchants of doubt. They want to create confusion. They want to make us think, oh, there's diet controversies about everything. There's diet wars. Nobody agrees on anything. And if you believe that, if you believe that nobody really agrees about anything, then you will fall back into old habits and patterns and you will be prey to those forces that want to keep you hooked on foods that are killing our world and killing you and causing tremendous harm. Mm. I think one of the things I love about how your message has continued to evolve, John, is that you've also distanced yourself in a way very intelligently from extremism in terms of uh, approaches to diet. I remember when I first took, you know, a foray into nutrition and health, you know, in, in, in 2003, 2005, 2006, there were these really strong movements around raw foodism and veganism, and it created dissonance. It's like, well, are you a vegan or are you a raw foodist? And how raw are you? And there was all these discussions. And, and then I, I, it was, it was really a strange world for a little bit because it's like either you're in the good camp or the bad camp. And that, that's not necessarily how the world works. And you, I remember going to a longevity now conference in Costa Mesa and you spoke, and I think it might've been around 2012, 14 or something like this, maybe 15. And you spoke and you said, it's no longer about trying to make the world go vegan. It's about trying to make large swathes of the population eat less processed refined foods and in particular processed factory farm meats. And I thought, wow, what a visionary because you really move beyond labels and you move to like, what is the big picture here? What if we could actually achieve a smaller reduction overall in the amount of, of meat consumption that would have a, a huge systemic impact on people's health. And that's still where you are today. And I love that you, that you, that you speak like this. Well, I've been on a journey with it as a lot of us have. Um, and I was more, uh, rigid and dogmatic at one time. Um, though I've always thought, you know, we need to respect people's choices and autonomy and their own in body wisdom and not everything, not every diet is going to be exactly right for every other person. Um, there's a tremendous amount of variation in our anatomy and our metabolism and our biochemistry. So you're a unique biochemical individual. And so you need to find what works for you and at, at a given stage in your life, it may change over time. Um, but we do know some basic principles, um, Twinkies and donuts and potato chips are not a good breakfast and mm -hmm. they, they, and, and we, and so and that's, and they're not a good breakfast for anybody. Uh, not in terms of their at health. Any not, at any stage of your life. <laughs> at any stage of their life. You know, and we, there's so much we can gain and, and, and on the, the vegan thing that there are a lot of vegan a activists who come across as very passionate and very, very dogmatic and, and kind of more vegan than thou. Um, Mm. My my understanding is that, um, well, let me ask ask it as a question. What do you think, and I'm asking this of, of our, our listeners and viewers too, what do you think the odds are, realistically, that in 10 years, half of the people in the industrialized world will be vegans? I would have to say, realistically, the odds of that are zero. <laughs> I, yeah. I might want that or think that would be a good idea, but I don't think it's going to happen. I, I realistically, no. But what are the odds? Consider this a question. What are the odds that in 10 years, half the meals eaten in the industrialized world will be vegan? Mm -hmm. I think that is possible. I think that's doable. And we don't get there by insisting that people, you know, meet our standards of purity or meet any purity standards, because this is not a purity mm -hmm. contest. And you don't have to sign a purity pact to be part of the food revolution, the food movement, the, the, the creation of a healthier yeah. you and a healthier lifestyle and having more joy in your life and more beauty and vibrancy and, and happiness in your life. That, that can come. You don't have to be a vegan to have that. You just have to be on a healthy eating path, on a food path that will bring you the health you, you need and deserve and want. 
and will help minimize the damage that's done by our agricultural systems to the planet, which today is spectacularly bad. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it is. And what, one of the things, you know, I, I love that, that, that vision of yours, John, and I think that everybody listening to this really subscribes to that. Many of the Food Matters community, I feel too, are many are more on the spectrum of, of, of plant-based or vegan, and some are more in the middle, and then some are just new to the party and like, well, what is all this information and research? How can I make sense of it? And we, we embody a very inclusive uh, approach to nutrition. And, and I, I even think if somebody is going from food to homemade food, but they're using margarine, which we know is a, an incredibly unhealthy product, that's still better than fast food. You know, so I think there's always an evolution yeah. of the journey. Yeah, that, and, that would be step and one. Yeah, and there's exactly. more steps. Oh. Mm -hmm. But, but mm -hmm. people proceed along a healthy food path at whatever pace makes sense to them. They have yes. their own, mm -hmm. you know, family issues. They, they, they have all the, mm -hmm. the situations that they're in. And they have access to what they have access to. They have the financial resources that they have. Mm -hmm. um, but there are certain things, like there's a class of foods, legumes, beans, split peas, things like that, lentils. They've been called, like, thought of as peasant food. They are inexpensive. Um, they store really well. Um, mm -hmm. They've got a lot of advantages, actually. Um, they're very high in protein. They're very high in, in, in the types of fiber that feed the, a healthy microbiome in your intestines, um, which we know we are learning more and more about the importance of that in terms of preventing disease. And in particular, by the way, in preventing autoimmune diseases and highly inflammatory conditions that, that a lot of us are suffering from these days. Mm -hmm. um, a healthier microbiome, such as one that's fed by the fibers in legumes and lots mm. of fruit, fresh, fresh vegetables and fruits um, really make your life sing. And, and we, we, we think of them as peasant food. They're, they are inexpensive. And sometimes we associate uh, a, a plant-based lifestyle, uh, eating lentils or beans instead of beef, not eating the steak, um, eating the greens instead. Yeah, we associate that with poverty. We associate that with, we think that, that, that a reward of affluence and, and a symbol of the good life is the big steak. Um, mm. And it's ironic because we're killing ourselves that way. And um, I, I, I think the, the reward of affluence is choice. And let's make those choices wisely so that more people can have access to healthy food so that we will feed our bodies and our spirits and our minds the fuel that will give us the greatest mental clarity, the greatest emotional empathy and resilience, give us the greatest physical vitality and less least susceptibility to disease. And in the process of that, work together so that more people can have the information and the access to the food so they too can be part of that because I'm not satisfied until, well, my prayer is may all be fed, may all be healed, may all be loved. And that's what I want. Mm, beautiful. Very, uh, very nice. One of, one of the big issues that we've been speaking a lot about in this summit and that, it, that is getting a lot of attention now is around inflammation. And I, I think rightly so, because infl inflammation seems to me implicated in, in just about every chronic disease. And it's a natural process. You know, acute inflammation is there to serve, to heal, to bring energy and heat to a, an environment to create a healing response. But we are triggering our bodies so often now we're moving into chronic inflammation where it never stops, it never turns off. And industrial meat being high in omega-9, low in omega-3 causes inflammation. What are some of the other big implicators in, in inflammation? Because this is a very easy skin for people to approach eating to save your life with. Okay, how do we eat a diet that's low in inflammation or high in anti-inflammatory foods in order to be able to ensure that we don't have this type of chronic, inflammation is like a chronic stress to the body. We know that chronic emotional stress 
can you know deplete our immune system it can drive down nutrients that are circulating in our body it can it can cause all sorts of issues and now chronic inflammation is almost like this chronic stress physically to the body what are, what are some of the foods that are, that are, that are highly implicated in, in inflammation and, and some of the foods that you would recommend specifically people eat to sort of help ease that type of, of chronic inflammation? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that directly in a second, but I first want to say something about inflammation. It is a natural process. And if your body experiences a cut, um, a, an assault or an insult somewhere, a problem somewhere, it will send extra blood there. It, it, it will inflame the area and it will, it will suffuse it with um, what is needed to heal that area. And it's an effort by the body to heal. And, it's, and it's, in many cases, it saves our lives. But today, the problem is we're eating so much bad food. And, and what that is, it's creating an assault and a toxicity and an insult to our bodies systemically everywhere because every organ and every cell in your body depends on the nutrients that you get from your food. So when, when that food is bad, then you're not getting the nutrients and you're getting other substances that are toxic. And that creates widespread inflammation. Now your body only has as much blood in it as it has, and it can't heal everything at once. When you're assaulting your entire system with bad food, you're in a state of chronic inflammation. And we can measure that and we know what it leads to. It leads to diabetes, it leads to obesity, it leads to high blood pressure, it leads to cancers, it leads to heart disease. It leads to far greater susceptibility to infectious diseases because your immune system isn't operating as well. It, it, it's really not a good thing. And the foods that cause it are the foods we're eating mostly. Factory farm meats, factory farm dairy products, factory farm eggs processed foods that are high in sugar, high in salt, what, high in bad sugars and bad salts and bad mm -hmm. fats. It's not a question of eating no fat. You need some fat in your diet, you need some fat to live a healthy life. But there are good fats and there are bad fats. And, and the good ones are seeds and nuts and olives and avocados. And if you're going to eat bottled oil, the best is extra virgin olive oil. Um, the bad fats are are in the processed meats, in the factory farm meats, in the margarines, like you mentioned earlier. Mm. Um, and we we want to keep away from those foods and eat more beans and other legumes, like I mentioned, fresh vegetables, particularly ones from the cabbage family, um, which is broccoli and cauliflower, flour and arugula and kale and collards and of course all kinds of cabbages and and um, that's a great family. Um, because it's mm. uniquely high in some anti-cancer uh, substances. But all vegetables are great. Uh, find ones you like, and then learn to like some of the others that you can. But start with the mm. ones that you already like. Learn how to prepare them so that you will love them, so they'll be attractive visually and also uh, delicious and nutrient-rich. Um, you can't, almost can't eat too many vegetables, fresh vegetables. And, and whole fruits are good too. Now, I'm not talking about fruit juice when you've stripped out the fiber and so forth, but eating an apple, eating an orange, eating a, some grapes, eating a pear. That's what, when I'm, when I'm hungry, when I need a snack, if, my, if I, I feel like my blood sugar is a little low, I want to lift, I don't, I don't go to candy. I don't go to something that's going to harm me. I've learned not to do that over time. And so I go and my favorite snack might be an apple and some walnuts or a banana and some walnuts or something like that. And I'm getting some fat, I'm getting some fruit and I feel great and it's delicious and it's also real. It's real food. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you want to eat that. And the grains, you know, if you eat grains, eat whole grains. It's very mm -hmm. important. And another piece to this is how the food is, is grown. So as much as possible, eat organic food grown food. And there are many reasons for that. And, and the primary one is that foods that are not organically grown are almost invariably grown with toxic chemicals. And that includes pesticides and herbicides and fungicides and insecticides, all kinds of biocides. And it also includes synthetic fertilizers that jumpstart the plant's growth in an, in an abnormal and unbalanced way. Um, 
so they may add nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium to the soil through chemical means. But all the other micronutrients, they're not adding. All the other minerals, they're not replacing in the soil. So the food doesn't, it maybe grows big and looks good, but it's insipid in taste. It's nutrient poor. And that's another reason to eat organic food, as well as sparing the farm workers, by the way. I sometimes hear people say, well, organic food is a, is a bad or it's a scam or it's, it's for the elite. <laughs> Well, it's unfortunately, it, it does cost more usually, and we need to change that. Mm -hmm. And at the Food Revolution Network, we're working very hard to change that, and I know you, you are mm -hmm. too, James, mm -hmm. um, because we want organic food available to everybody. Um, mm -hmm. um, I, but, but the farm workers bear the highest brunt of, of, of the assault of pesticides. They're working in the fields. Mm -hmm. They're picking the food that we're eating. They're harvesting the food that comes to our table. Um, basic decency. Re requires us to think about these people and their well-being. And, and if we're drenching them in pesticides, um, which is what happens in conventional agriculture, mm. that's one of the reasons why these, these people have such short lifespans. And, and among migrant farm workers in the United States, the um, average um, age of death right now is in the low 40s. And the, the levels of cancer and the level, levels of birth defects in their kids are very very high and to me this is this is unacceptable this is abominable this is abhorrent and we we, we can change it we don't have to participate in it we don't have to pay for it by buying the products mm. that are produced this what that way um so if we can afford and we, if we can get organic food that's that's a real plus uh for a lot of these a lot of these reasons mm, beautiful and i mean well shocking but also a beautiful solution and an elegant and simple solution, really. <clears throat> I mean, I, I call it this concept and many others too, voting with your shopping trolley. You know, w what you want to see in the world needs to be voted with by you on a daily basis with your, your consumer spending habits. And I think that really shifts the power back into the we, the us, the community. Because if we yeah. shift our habits yeah. and say, we're going to only buy these products now, then conventional, which really should be called chemical agriculture or, or not not conventional it could be it, it's the opposite organic should just be normal standard yeah. as it was as it was forever uh and then you there's know, this think, new I type of, that, right? of it i i agree i we we have what, what has been called special food stores that are called health food stores or whole food stores or natural food stores mm. and i always think well then what are the others unnatural unhealthy <laughs> and um unwhole uh food mm. stores and wouldn't it be nice if it was the other way around that that instead of um when you go into a store that sells all kinds of things the, the organic foods is marked specially and they're in a special area usually the prices are higher mm. how about it would be if it was, if we just did a figure ground switch and everything that was grown organically was just there and everything that wasn't mm. It, it listed the the chemicals and the pesticides that were applied to the to the mm. plant while it was growing, or to the were, were fed to the animal while it was uh, in a factory farm. Um, the antibiotics that were used on the animal, the the, the hormones that were injected in the animal, mm. the uh, the poisons that were used to try mm. to deal with the flies in, in places. Mm. Um, if 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 the list of poisons were there on what we now call conventional food. And the organic food maybe just was there because it's it is the natural way to eat it. It's it's how our this a whole idea of chemical based agriculture is really a very recent uh, development in human history. Um, That's true. And it's it's killing the world. It, mm -hmm. It's destroying the topsoil. It's it's destroying the viability of our soils to produce food for uh, coming generations. And it's killing us in making us sick and fat and it's not necessary no there are alternatives i agree and well, imagine if imagine if these meat products for instance had uh warning causes uh inflammation in the body warning uh yes. may cause cancer like the processed meats i mean that that's really where we should be heading ideally but we're up yes. against dismantling these massive industries that have, are employing tens of thousands of people and are putting money in a lot of people's pockets and that's a really difficult situation 
way. Yeah, and they've hooked up. You know, they, they've hooked our taste buds. They've hijacked them. Mm -hmm. they, they have pulverized them. I remember I grew up eating the standard American diet with probably more ice cream than most people. But um, and, and what happened to me, because the ice cream was so sweet, obviously very high in sugar and, and bad fats. I was sick a lot, um, pretty much sick all the time. And I couldn't taste anything else. I mean, all vegetables mm -hmm. tasted bland to me. Uh, even an apple seemed kind of, well, it was juicy, I guess. But, you know, the, the, the sweetness in an apple wasn't enough to touch my taste buds that had been inundated with the intensely sweet flavors of ice creams and the intensely salty flavors of some of our commercial chips and, and so forth. Mm. Um, in canned soups um, are often very, very high in salt. So I couldn't taste anything else. And if you get fed me healthy, natural food, I, I, I wouldn't taste it. I couldn't taste it. Kind of like you don't see the stars when there's bright lights out. Mm. But when you turn down those bright lights, maybe if the if the sky is clear, you, you have a, a vault of stars, a magnific magnificent, majestic, spectacular display of stars. And and I started to, when I stopped eating, I turned off the unnecessary artificial lights. I stopped eating the artificial foods and I stopped eating sweetened foods, um, highly sweetened foods. I stopped eating ice cream. I stopped eating the stuff that was hijacking my taste buds. And now I get more pleasure as a hedonist. I get more simple pleasure in my taste buds by eating, say, a, a baked potato than I used to when I ate a baked potato smothered in butter and sour cream and 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 yeah. other things. Um, just simple foods now that, that I couldn't taste and, and at one time now taste, they, they can just send me in, into rapture, honestly. They taste mm. so great mm. if they're fresh. That's another yeah. thing. Once your taste buds mm. are intact and back, you know whether foods are, t are fresh or not. Um, and they want to sell you the old stuff. So they don't want you to be able to taste the difference. And they just will <laughs> fill it full of salt and sugar and fat, bad fats and additives and flavorings and other kinds of weird substances to alter the, the textures and the mouthfeel. And you'll think you're, you're happy and you think you're being stimulated in a positive way. You're being destroyed by people mm. who are only thinking about their own pocketbook. They are not. One of the things that's so strange is that we have a food industry that does not care at all about the health value of the food they serve. Now they'll mm. put a health halo, they'll add some vitamins or this or that and plaster it on the package because they think it will sell. Mm. But that's why they're doing it. They're not doing it because they think it's healthier for you. They don't care. Mm. And it, it's that indifference to, to human well-being that is one of the deep, deep sadnesses of our times, that people in positions of great power don't care about others. And mm -hmm. that selfishness, that self-absorption that uh, divides us so deeply and, and it, it costs us all tremendously. And I, I think that when we have a f food choice option, mm -hmm. um, that all people could eat. I and mean, we don't have enough land to, to, to grow grass fed beef for everybody at the levels people are eating them today. Um, but we would need much less land it, to grow a, a plant based diet or an essentially plant based diet when the amount of meat that's consumed is much less. And we could feed everybody a healthy, organic, natural, fresh, nutrient rich diet on a tenth the land that we're now using call it with and, and leaves wild wild spaces for for wildlife for forests to return uh, for biodiversity to return and instead of stomping all over this planet we could help lower our footprint we could lower our carbon emissions we could l lower the damage we're doing to life and to ourselves and to me, that fact that what serves you in this situation serves each of us in this situation, a healthy diet, a natural diet, uh, eating low on the food chain, eating, eating organically when we can, serves others too.
it really does allow for more people to be fed. It really does allow for more species to exist. It really does allow for the water to be cleaner and the soil to be richer and the air to be cleaner and, and the future to be brighter. And today, when it's hard to look into the future and see brightness, to see joy, to, to have feelings of hope and joy well up within us, to, to be able to have a vision of a possibility that could create greater health and joy and wellness on this planet for all beings. I'm very moved by that. I, I find that mm. profoundly moving. And I, I've basically given my life to conveying that and communicating that and, and, and hopefully inspiring that direction in as many people as possible. Beautiful. And I really feel you when you talk about <clears throat> this idea of when you clean your diet up, you take, say, uh, a 21 day period and you just say, I'm going to eat clean or you do a detox or a cleanse or there's juice cleanses, but taking a period of time where you just eat clean foods and you take out a lot of the processed foods and the refined foods and the refined sugars and, and, and too much refined uh, glutinous products or too much refined flour products or baked cookies or or cakes, and you, and you start to just input more vegetables, more fruits, more nuts, more seeds, more natural foods, less or no dairy, um, and you start to move these things out and move new things in, then after 21 days or, or two months, you go back and you start to eat the old foods you used to eat, and you, you sort of can't anymore. It's a different relationship. It's like something has changed, something has shifted, and before, like you said, growing up, being, being in the family that you did and having access to so much ice cream, a, a peach tasted blah to you. But I know personally, if I've done a cleanser, if I've eaten clean, and then I eat a peach, it's like the most explosive, incredible <laughs> experience you can ever imagine. And I wish that for all people. And I think we're so bombarded. We're treating our taste buds like amusement parks. And the food industry yeah. is, is serving that purpose to keep us addicted, to keep us going back for more. The MSG, the additives, the flavorings, the fake foods, the highly processed, refined gluten and sugar products, which light up our brain and cause addiction, all designed, like you say, to get us to eat more. But once you break off that chain and you go on a plan of just saying eating clean, then you start to re reassess and reapproach everything with a new viewpoint. It's almost like a spiritual awakening. It's, a, it's an awakening of sorts. And, and many people do experience higher states of being after eating in this way, and they can't believe that they, how much better they feel. I mean, it's almost hard to talk about, but I know with Food Revolution Network and with Food Matters, we've guided hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of people in this change, and it's consistent. It works almost all the time. People have this euphoric type experience, right? What are some of the biggest things that you would say are your top things to look out for when transitioning to a healthier diet or some of the things that you love including more of at the moment? Like what, is, what are you saying? You, I mean, you mentioned lentils are a great thing and maybe just elaborate a little bit on the end here on eating lower down the food chain. You just said that and I understood what that means. That's like anchovies over tuna or crickets over beef. But I don't think yeah. many people understand that. So maybe, maybe just touch in on that a little bit because I think it's important for people to understand if they don't want to stop eating meat or fish, for instance, well, what type of fish would be a better choice, this lower down the food chain? And if they're happy to go more plant-based, what are some of the great foods that you think are underutilized in that space? Well, when you mentioned fish, and, and that's a good example because fish have long food chains. This little fish get eat eaten by this by slightly larger fish who get eaten by slightly larger fish and so forth. We have treated our, our oceans and our rivers and our lakes like garbage dumps. And there are a lot of toxic metals and um, toxic chemicals in our oceans today and our lakes and rivers. That's a disgrace. It's a tragedy, but it's also a truth. And so the, the, the fish that, sl that swim in these waters in, inevitably um, in, in, in absorb these into their systems. And then they concentrate as you go up the food chain. In other words, the smaller fish tend to have less, but the larger fish tend to have the most, which is one of the reasons why tuna, which is a very large fish, uh, is so high in mercury. 
Uh, and mercury is, is something you really don't want a lot of. And that's one of the problems with today's fish and particularly today's tuna. But some of the smaller fish like sardines, and then there's a, a t some, some salmon, although they're not tiny, also because of the nature of their systems and their metabolism, they don't, um, they don't hold on to the mercury the way other fish tend to. So salmon and, and sardines are really good choices, also anchovies, as you mentioned, uh, if you're gonna eat fish. Uh, and they're also happen to be those same, those same fish happen to be higher in the long chain omega-3 fatty acids, DHA and EPA that are so important for brain health and heart health. So if you're gonna eat fish, that's, those are the ones to, to uh, favor. Um, uh, what was your other question? It was about <clears throat> what are some of the main plant-based type foods that you think are underutilized or, or underappreciated that people could learn to love more things like, I mean, cauliflower, I mean, you put a little bit of olive oil or coconut oil and some curry spice on a whole cauliflower head and put it in the oven and sort of let it go for a long time. And you peel it open and yeah. it's white and it's tasty. I mean, this, I'm, I'm, I keep discovering so many things. I just love to hear from you. Yeah. Like what are some of your favorite little tricks or hacks that you love going oh, to that are just okay. so healthy well, and so um, simple just to wrap up. Here, I think it's a great little practice that, really like, that aren't too common. Um, I get black raspberry powder, organic black raspberry powder. That's not blackberry. It's a black berry, but it's not a blackberry. It's a raspberry that's black. Mm. And it's very high in anthocyanins and very high in very particular nutrients that our body craves. All berries, by the way, are really great foods. Um, black raspberries and, and, and wild blueberries probably are the cream of the crop, so to speak, uh, in terms of nutrients. Mm. Um, I have a dedicated coffee grinder that I, I grind uh, flax seeds and chia seeds in every every day or every couple of days. Um, they are highly perishable. Their, their fats are such mm. that they, they oxidize rapidly. So you, you don't want to, you want them fresh as possible. So I grind them each day or every couple of days and uh, sprinkle them on just about everything that I eat. And um, they're very high in some very specific nutrients that are anti-cancer and anti-obesogens, anti and which to mm -hmm. say they help you lose weight and um, um, help, help your blood pressure come down and um, protect you uh, in all kinds of ways. Um, beans, I think beans are underrated because they have this association with poverty and poor people and, and, and peasant food. And that, 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 that keeps people sometimes from appreciating them, but they're wonderful foods and there's some tricks to, to cooking them. Um, of course, can't you can buy them canned, that's fine too. But if you're gonna cook your own, what you wanna do is soak them overnight or soak them even for 48 hours mm -hmm. and rinse them times during the course of that and then cook them. And the, you'll find the, um, them to be far less flatulent producing that way. Um, and that's good. Most people will appreciate that. Feels better, better, better for your social life. Um, bean, beans are remarkable foods and in all the, mm. the blue zones, all the places on earth where we have found the healthiest and most long lived peoples. One of the things they have in common they're they're all over the planet, but they all eat beans. They are other legumes. Yeah. They all base their diets mm. around that, and they all eat very few animal products. They do eat some, but very mm. few and never from a factory farm. And they don't eat any processed foods and they don't eat any industrialized foods. And they eat foods in season. They eat foods that grow where they where they are. Um, they don't eat a lot. They don't overeat. Like they do follow Michael Pollan's rule, not too much. Yeah. Um, because they get joy in life. They feel good. They they they're alive and vital. And they're not eating to stuff down emotions. They're not eating to amuse themselves to death. They're not eating to entertain themselves out of boredom. They're not bored. They're alive and they're connected with each other and they're connected with the natural world and they're connected with their own aspirations and goals and purpose for being alive. And they're, they're connected to their love. And through that, mm -hmm. they're connected empathically with other people and they don't need artificial stimulation then to feel alive and safe and happy and, and, and comfortable in their, in their skin. And we can learn from them. Mm -hmm. And I think we should. And 
if we do, we'll eat more beans and we'll we'll live happier, simpler, simpler, healthier lives. John, I, I think you're, you know, it's so great chatting to you again, John. You're, you're really such a guide and a scholar and a gentleman and a researcher and a practical real person in terms of communicating this message of eating to save your life. And and I love really the core premise of what you're saying here is take some space, take some time, clean up your diet, clean up your life, and then watch things transform and unfold. Not only will you feel better, you'll be a beacon of hope for other people in your family. You'll also yeah. be imparting these positive changes on your relationship to your environment and the, and, and, and the birds and the, and the bees and, and the trees and the agriculture and the soil and the microbes. And you'll then now improve your relationship with food where a peach is a, a game-changing event to sit down and eat a peach or, or soaking and cooking beans in a proper, proper way becomes this delicious meal. Or I have you know, this, this lentil curry where I soak the lentils overnight and then strain the water a few times and then cook them and then do the curry spices. And it's just a labor of love and it tastes so good and it's so simple and so beautiful and it requires no misery, no death, and it improves my health. And like you said, it can also be a little bit flexible. You know, you can have a little yeah. bit of these products if you feel so or whatever, but be conscious about your choices and choose this middle path. And I think it's such an enlightening and empowering message, John. And I'm, I'm so privileged to do this film project with you and I can't wait for it to be released to the world and for more people to discover the power of your work and your message and, and, and just so grateful for this uh, time again and this interview today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, James. It's always been a pleasure working with you and um, working on the film project, which was really a, a somewhat epic of, event for me and I know for, for you and your staff, mm -hmm. uh, your team um, of wonderful people. You have the best people working with you and for you. I, I, I got to meet a number of them, work closely with a number of them. and. Wonderful, wonderful, skilled, uh, grounded, solid, brilliant people, and creative people. And that, that's what we're gonna be, maybe we'll all become a little more like that as, as we move through the world. And, and thanks to your work and, and the people you interview and the people you, you, whose voices you bring, whose messages you bring forward, um, we have a better shot at it. So thank you, Let's James, do it. thank you. Th thank you so much, John. Uh, have a wonderful day and thank you again for your time.